season, we have been looking at ways we can invite the holy into our presence and live with the holy in our midst. And the scripture today from Colossians gives you a, an understanding of what it means to like dwell with the Spirit in you, right? That if you allow God's presence to guide your life, these are the things that will, will show from what you do, right? You will be humble and gentle. You will practice kindness. That, this is the hard one for me, you will be able to forgive when somebody does you wrong. You will bathe yourself in a sense of peace. That love will be present in you. And one of the things it says in that passage is that you will dwell. You will let the word dwell within you. As I was thinking about this scripture, one of the stories of Christmas that I think illustrates what it means to let God dwell within you is the story of when Jesus and Joseph and Mary go to the temple to present Jesus to the temple as holy. So it says, and now, you know, Luke makes up what he wants in order to make a point. So they go to the temple to get him circumcised, which probably was not the case. But they make an offering there. And the point that Luke wants to make is they're making this offering in the temple is that this family is really poor because all they have to offer in the temple is a, a tiny bird. Whereas if you have wealth and money, you are able to make a bigger sacrifice for your baby. And so Luke wants us to know that this couple is, is doing the right things, but they don't come from the privileged class. They come from the ordinary people the poor in the country. And then it says that before this was happening, Simeon was at home. And Simeon was a man filled with the Holy Spirit who had been promised that before he died, he would see the Messiah. That the Messiah would come and he would experience the Messiah's presence and so Simeon waited. Into his old age, he waited for this, this event, this presence of the Messiah to show up. And so that day that Joseph and Mary and Jesus are in the temple, the Holy Spirit pushes Simeon to go to the temple. And when he is at the temple, he sees Jesus. And he knows he knows that this is the one. And then he sings. Because in Luke's gospel, you don't just experience the presence of the baby, you sing about the presence of the baby. And so Simeon sings, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Simeon sings to that baby. He tells that baby that I've finally seen it. I've experienced what God's Spirit has told me. I've experienced that this child is going to bring revelation to the people is going to bring salvation to the people. And then he says, but don't think this is going to be easy. I'll give you the real word so you know I'm not making it up. He says, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. 
So he sings praise to God. And then he mourns the family that as this child grows into being the savior of the world, as this child grows up to be the Christ, the Messiah, that the words and actions he takes are not going to be easy for other people. That in fact, there are people who will see right before their eyes what God's presence in the world can do, who will discount it and throw it aside to follow their own understanding. That it will pit, as Jesus later says in the scripture, mother and father, brother and sister, family against each other, if you truly follow the word. But what Simeon illustrates from the passage of Colossians is that when you're open to the Spirit, the Spirit will guide you to places and people that change your understanding of the world, that change your place in the world, that show you the presence of God. How many of us allow the Spirit to push us? To push us to experience the holy amongst people that we wouldn't expect to experience the holy in. Because, let's be honest, you're not going to pick the poor family to be the one that gives you the savior of the world, right? The Messiah, the Christ. And yet Simeon could see in them the presence of God. But he's not alone that day in the temple. In the temple that day, it says there was Anna, the prophet. So any of those people who tell you women can't be preachers in church, there, before Jesus is even grown up, there is a woman in church who's a prophet preaching, just so you know. <laughs> and Anna, it says, has reached her 84th year. And it describes her life a little, saying that she had been married and has now lived seven years beyond her husband. And that she's devoted and has given her life to the temple where she prays and sings and speaks about God. And when she sees the baby, she's much more enthusiastic than Simeon. Because Simeon, you know, is a little bit of a downer, his prophecy and song. But Anna is joyous and jubilant, talking about the redemption of Jerusalem. She dances and sings, filled with the power of the Spirit. It's a joyous event for her to see the presence of this baby, the Christ child in her midst. How many of us get joyous and excited like that when we talk about our faith, about God? Allow that experience of the holy through us. In fact, some of us, it's a little scary, right? Because we're not from one of those churches where they dance in the aisles with the spirit. We do it more quietly. But there's something to be said for that sense, that power of the Spirit that brings you such joy that you can't help but sing, that you can't help but dance, that you want to share that experience of the holy with all those around you in a way that is so jubilant and happy and joyful. Anna represents the Christmas we think about, right? When we think about Christmas. Not the hymn that Zechariah taught us, not the words that Mary sings, but that sense of we sing these Christmas songs because they bring us such joy and happiness. They fill us with a lightness in our being. I mean, because even this year, as we look around the world and go, oh, when I put that Christmas music on, 
It changes your spirit just a little as you watch the Christmas lights twinkle on your tree and you start singing those songs. They help you to experience all those things that Colossians tells us will happen when you dwell in the holy. You experience that peace that our turbulent world right now does not seem to give us. You have that sense that we can be kind, that we can be gentle with each other, that we can forgive each other. So, you know we've been ending with a song, right? So this week's song is a little trickier, so I've got the words um, for us to sing later, but they may not fit, so when we get to the third verse, just whatever happens, happens. <laughs> but she represents, the song itself represents that sense of Anna being so jubilant about what Christmas can be, about what this baby means for the world, the redemption of Israel. And so the song that we're going to learn about this week is Good Christian Friends Rejoice. And yes, they changed the word to make it inclusive of all of us. So if you have to sing the old word, it's fine. But this song was a song that wasn't actually sung in church because it was too boisterous and joyful. It was a carol that was sung out in the streets in which there was dancing. Because in mass, in the church, it was somber. It was the quiet, melodic tunes. And this one, Good Christian Friends Rejoice, is full of happiness and cheer. And the verse that is left out, because it's tricky to think, sing, I think is why it was probably dropped, says, in sweet jubilation, now sing and be joyful. The joy of our hearts lies in a manger and shines like the sun in the lap of his mother, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. So let us remember that the joy of our hearts lies in the simplest majors. May our church be a lap of the mother to those who need it most. Amen.